Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this third day of August. It is day 215 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, somebody who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does and direct our hearts now to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. So we come to Him. First and foremost, above all things, we come to Him because He is Mr. Life itself. And in Him we live and move and have our being. In Him is fullness of joy. And so we come. We come just as we are. We come beaten, broken, tired, hungry, thirsty, restless. We come. We come with joy. We come with anticipation. We come. And today we're going to listen and receive from him as we look into the book of Nahum, chapters 1 through 3. And then we'll finish our reading in John chapter 5. Father, we come. Nahum chapter 1. This message concerning Nineveh came as a vision to Nahum, who lived in Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous God, filled with vengeance and rage. He takes vengeance on all who oppose him and continues to rage against his enemies. The Lord is slow to get angry, but his power is great, and he never lets the guilty go unpunished. He displays his power in the whirlwind and the storm. The billowing clouds are the dust beneath his feet. At his command, the oceans dry up, and the rivers disappear. The lush pastures of Bashan and Carmel fade, and the green forests of Lebanon wither. In his presence, the mountains quake, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles and its people are destroyed. Who can stand before his fierce anger? Who can survive his burning fury? His rage blazes forth like fire, and the mountains crumble to dust in his presence. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. But he will sweep away his enemies in an overwhelming flood. He will pursue his foes into the darkness of night. Why are you scheming against the Lord? He will destroy you with one blow. He won't need to strike twice. His enemies, tangled like thorn bushes and staggering like drunks, will be burned up like dry stubble in a field. Who is this wicked counselor of yours who plots evil against the Lord? This is what the Lord says. Though the Assyrians have many allies, they will be destroyed and disappear. Oh, my people, I have punished you before, but I will not punish you again. Now I will break the yoke of bondage from your neck and tear off the chains of the Assyrian oppression. And this is what the Lord says concerning the Assyrians in Nineveh. You will have no more children to carry on your name. I will destroy all the idols in the temples of your gods. I am preparing a grave for you because you are despicable. Look, a messenger is coming over the mountains with good news. He is bringing a message of peace. Celebrate your festivals, O people of Judah, and fulfill all your vows, for your wicked enemies will never invade your land again. They will be completely destroyed. Nahum chapter 2 Your enemy is coming to crush you, Nineveh. Man the ramparts, watch the roads, prepare your defenses, call out your forces. Even though the destroyer has destroyed Judah, the Lord will restore its honor. Israel's vine has been stripped of branches but he will restore its splendor. Shields flash red in the sunlight. See the scarlet uniforms of the valiant troops. Watch as their glittering chariots move into position, with the forest of spears waving above them. The chariots race recklessly onto the streets and rush wildly through the squares. They flash like firelight and move as swiftly as lightning. The king shouts to his officers. They stumble in their haste, rushing to the walls to set up their defenses. The river gates have been torn open. The palace is about to collapse. 
Nineveh's exile has been decreed, and all the servant girls mourn its capture. They moan like doves and beat their breast in sorrow. Nineveh is like a leaking water reservoir. The people are slipping away. Stop! Stop! Someone shouts, but no one even looks back. Loot the silver! Plunder the gold! There's no end to Nineveh's treasure, its vast, uncounted wealth. Soon the city is plundered, empty and ruined. Hearts melt and knees shake, and the people stand aghast. Their faces is pale and trembling. Where now is that great Nineveh, that den filled with young lions? It was a place where people like lions and their cubs walked freely without fear. The lion tore up meat for his cubs and strangled prey for his mate. He filled his den with prey, his caverns with his plunder. I am your enemy, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Your chariots will soon go up in smoke. Your young men will be killed in battle. Never again will you plunder conquered nations. The voice of your proud messengers will be heard no more. Nahum chapter 3 What sorrow awaits Nineveh? The city of murder and lies. She is crammed with wealth and is never without victims. Hear the cracks of whips, the rumble of wheels, horses' hooves pound and chariots clatter wildly. See the flashing swords and the glittering spears as the charioteers charge past. There are countless casualties, heaps of bodies, so many bodies that people stumble over them. All this because Nineveh, the beautiful and faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, enticed the nations with her beauty. She taught them all her magic, enchanting people everywhere. I am your enemy, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and now I will lift your skirts and show all the earth your nakedness and shame. I will cover you with filth and show the world how vile you really are. All who see you will shrink back and say, Nineveh lies in ruins. Where are the mourners? Does anyone regret your destruction? Are you any better than the city of Thebes, situated on the Nile River, surrounded by water? She was protected by the river on all sides, walled in by water. Ethiopia and the land of Egypt gave unlimited assistance. The nations of Put and Libya were among her allies, yet Thebes fell, and her people were led away as captives. Her babies were dashed to death along the stones of the streets. Soldiers threw dice to get Egyptian officers as servants. All their leaders were bound in chains. And you, Nineveh, will also stagger like a drunkard. You will hide for fear of the attacking enemy. All your fortresses will fall, They will be devoured like the ripe figs that fall into the mouths of those who shake the trees. Your troops will be as weak and helpless as women. The gates of your land will be opened wide to the enemy and set on fire and burned. Get ready for the siege. Store up water. Strengthen the defenses. Go into the pits to trample clay and pack it into molds, making bricks to repair the walls. But the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you down, the enemy will consume you like locusts, devouring everything they see. There will be no escape, even if you multiply like swarming locusts. Your merchants have multiplied until they outnumber the stars, but like a swarm of locusts, they strip the land and fly away. Your guards and officials are also like swarming locusts that crowd together in the hedge on a cold day, but like locusts that fly away when the sun comes up, All of them will fly away and disappear. Your shepherds are asleep, O Assyrian king. Your princes lie dead in the dust. Your people are scattered across the mountains with no one to gather them together. There is no healing for your wound. Your injury is fatal. All who hear of your destruction will clap their hands for joy. Where can anyone be found who has not suffered from your continual cruelty? John 5. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. 
Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, The man who healed me told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God, who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. But they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. If I were testifying on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me, and I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so that you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they proved that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face. And you do not have his message in your hearts, because you do not believe me, the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me, because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name, and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? And now may the one 
whom these scriptures point us to, the one who is eternal life. May he open our eyes to see him. Amen. Is God's love in you? In John 4.51, Jesus tells the religious leaders, Your approval means nothing to me, because you don't have God's love in you. God's love is there. God's love came into the world for all people, including these he's talking to right now. But they don't recognize him or it. The love of God does not resonate within them. Instead, they are obsessed with control, power, the rules, judgment, wrath, and they've missed God altogether. Jesus said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But the scriptures speak of me, and you refuse to come to me. And yet there he was, coming to them, Mr. Love standing right there in front of them. God's love was there. They just refused to recognize it. Today, we have a choice to come to him. And when we do, we will recognize that he is already there. We might be struggling to recognize him because of what we've been told. You may have missed him because you've been told that he's about power and control, rules and wrath and judgment, and you've missed him. Well, John tells us that he is love, and we don't want to miss that. And his love is already there in our hearts, waiting for us to recognize him. The prayer of my own heart today is that I will see it, that I'll come to the one who is what I've always hoped for and sought, the one who is already there, the one who is love itself. That's the prayer that I have for my own heart. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, and my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, 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 DRB Nation, I hope that you are doing well out there. I hope that you are staying cool because I hear it has been hot. Thankfully, here in the Portland area, it's uh, not so bad. But uh, I know that for some of you, it has been days upon days of incredible heat. So may God give you shelter May God keep those AC units running, and may you stay safe. And to the rest of my DRB folks, I hope that you too are enjoying these days of summer. Boy, it's amazing that it's already here. Here we are in August, the dog days of summer, and uh, man, the time flies. And the challenge, of course, is to make the most of the time to seize the days that we have to live with our eyes and most importantly our hearts wide open to God present with us to God present even in our neighbors God present in the least of these that we would have eyes to see him to behold the God who is with us, and that our hearts would be expanded, that we would learn to rest in him and to know his joy, that we would become what we are, children of God. That's my prayer, my friend, and uh, I hope that this month that we have before us will give us many opportunities to do that very thing. Well, speaking of opportunities, this podcast has been, or has been, just an enormous gift and opportunity for Heather and myself to connect with you, to do something very simple yet so profound and important, something as simple as 
reading the scriptures every day in community with others, to remind our hearts every day of the inexplicable reality of God's love. And I want to thank you for being a part of that. This whole thing happens because you are a part of it. Because sisters and brothers have come alongside and said, hey, I, I insist on being a part of it. And I'm so grateful for people like Kenneth Blevins, Demetrius Donisaro, Jackie Caddy, James Atkins, Suzanne and Larry Singer, John Vanderwater, and Andrea Rowe. Blessings to you, my sisters and my brothers. And if you'd like to join this happy group of folks, man, you are so welcome to do that. And it is so appreciated and so needed. And all you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com. Click on the donate link and you will be on your way. Well, I'm going to be on my way now, but what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow and we will do it again. That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength and let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.